Hey everybody, this is Tracy here with another edition of A View from Tracy's Point, and we are here tonight to recap Shots Fired Season 1, Episode 6, which was titled The Fire This Time. Lord have mercy, I had to pull myself together after this episode. I went through so many emotions. I mean, I was sad. I was crying. I was angry. At one point, I was like, breathe, girl, breathe, girl, because I literally was sitting there holding my breath. Reggie and Gina <laughs> and crew, you guys have really done a great job with this show. And I mean, whereas this episode was phenomenal, the previews for next week, I don't even know if I can take it. It just... Oh my God, this show is just so real and I cannot believe that people, black people, are not on social media talking about this show the same way they do other shows that have no relevance whatsoever to their lives. But they are missing out if they are not watching this. So let's go ahead and get into the recap. So the show opens with Sean and his classmates getting ready to head off to school and you know he's kind of being embarrassed by Shamika you know because she wants a hug and a kiss before he gets on the bus and so there's a lot of protests that are continuing so as the kids are on the school bus headed off you know they're passing by the protests for Joey Campbell as well as the ones that are ongoing for Jesse Carr. So Pastor Janae is um hosting a rally or she's speaking at a rally talking to protesters and in her mind she's calming them down but i found that the words she was using in her speech you know it's still like a questionable rhetoric going on that could have you know like she kept saying things about you know anger and fighting back and riots and all of that but you can tell that the focus was on those negative words, whereas the message she was trying to get out as powerful as it was and as meaningful as it was, you can tell that the crowd was angry and that they were upset. And the only thing that they were probably hearing were those negative words that were coming out, even though she was trying to use them in a positive way. And so as she's speaking, this white kid comes up who looked like um, Dylan Roof. I don't know if that was intentional or not. But he walks up and he has this um, Confederate bandana around his neck. And I think he threw a bottle into the crowd. I'm thinking like, boy, are you crazy? Because all these black people up here angry and upset and protesting and you coming up here by yourself throwing a bottle. So anyway, you know, they get him up, but uh, Pastor Janae go and save him from them ass women. <laughs> so she, you know, talks to him and speaks love to him. And then when she gets through talking, she tells him that nobody's going to bother him so he can go ahead and leave. And so he turns around and he walks away. You can tell that he was scared half to death, but nobody bothered him. So then we move over to Preston and Ash and, you know, they're working on their storyboard as they try to continue to piece things together. And Preston wants to go after Arlen Cox because remember in the last episode they determined that there was this auxiliary of volunteer deputies who um, <clears throat> were working with the police officers and I guess if you made a donation to the governor's campaign or something that you were able to become a part of this auxiliary. And so he decides to have Ash actually talk to Cox and then he's going to talk to the governor. And then we find out that they're actually meeting them at a groundbreaking ceremony for Arlen Cox's um, privatized prison that he's building over there in the Gate Station community. So, you know, there's scenes of the city and you can just tell that, you know, things are very tense at the moment and it's on the verge of exploding. And so the governor, like I said, the governor's over there doing her groundbreaking um, ceremony, which I just cannot understand how she could be, you know, one of her biggest donors, one of her biggest bikers is this man that wants to build this humongous prison. And that is so obvious, you know, the whole pipeline to prison thing that's going on. But I don't know if people just feel powerless in the community and that's why they're not speaking out on it, but it is just so crazy that she can come into the community and talk about unity and peace and better schools and then she's also you know over there got a hand in um, Arlen Cox's pocket as he's getting ready to build this prison 
So at the groundbreaking, Preston lets the governor know that Cox may be connected to the murder of Joey Campbell. And then Ash is over, you know, talking to Cox, trying to pick his brain and get him to slip up and say something that he shouldn't. But Cox says that he's very proud to be a volunteer deputy and he wishes that he had more time to spend more time riding around with the police officers messing with people. So Preston and Sarah get into it afterwards because she realizes that um, Preston... I guess while they were together one night, he saw the donors list and took the information and that's how he knows about Arlen Cox. So the two of them have a big blowout. So I guess that little situation is over <laughs> between the two of them. So then we have Sheriff Platt and he calls in Lieutenant Breland to let him know that he just got a call that Sergeant Durkins committed suicide by driving his car into the lake. And if you guys recall, Durkins is the deputy who left um, gate station and went to this other uh, sheriff's office that's like out in the boondocks where nothing's going on and Ash realizes that you know he was part of the whole Joey um, Campbell shooting and he knows more than what he's saying and then Sheriff Pratt you know after he breaks the news to Breland he tells him that you know they need to go out um, go outside and for him to pretend like he's surprised so when they go outside the office into like the main common area where all the officers are we find out that it's Breland's 25th anniversary with the force and so as they're, you know, yelling surprise and celebrating, Alicia Carr walks in and she walks past all the police officers and goes over to Joshua Beck. And then she says that, you know, there was all these things that she wanted to say to him, you know, because she's angry and everything. But she just wants to know, did um, Jesse suffer? And what was his last words? And she wants to know if Beck, you know, why he was comforting Jesse waiting on the ambulance to come. Did he apologize to him? So Joshua says that um, Jesse didn't suffer. And when he says that, Alicia says, well, I hope you suffer every day for the rest of your life and how she's never going to forgive him. But I was just thinking to myself again that if the tables were turned and, and Beck was a white police officer and Alicia Carr was the mother of a black child, she never would have waltzed her little ass up into that uh, police station and gotten that close to him. So we had already had the scene where Jesse's dad pulled the gun on Beck and nothing happened with that. Now you got Alicia Carr just walking into the sheriff's office and confronting him. So just craziness. Governor Emmons goes to see Sheriff Platt to ask him if it's true that one of the auxiliary officers was present at Joey Campbell's shooting. And so he's telling her, you know, that Preston and Ash, you know, that they're blowing things out of proportion and it's not that big of a deal. But Emmons is concerned that, you know, it, the whole auxiliary thing was her idea and that she is going to look bad if it comes out that one of the deputies actually was, you know, killed a citizen. And so the two of them go back and forth and then she, he made some comment about her bringing in the Department of Justice when she should have just let him take care of everything. And then she says, well, you've already shown me, you know, that you're not up to task because if you were, then Beck would not still be on duty. So after Governor Emmons leaves, um, Sheriff Platt finds Joshua Beck and tells him that he has to put him on administrative leave and that he needs to turn in his gun and his badge and that, you know, he has to leave the police station immediately. So as Beck is leaving, he runs into Ash and Preston and, you know, he lets them know that he's been relieved of his duties. So then Preston asks if they can talk and then Beck says, oh, well, we can talk later, but not here. And then he walks off. So Preston and Ash end up going inside where they're met by Sheriff Platt. And he tells them that he wants to show them something. So then we move to a scene where Lieutenant Breland is in the interrogation room. And he has this black guy in there. And the black guy is allegedly confessing to being a weed dealer and he says that joey campbell was his supplier now remember joey campbell was like a teenager and this guy looks like he could be 20 or 21 years old but he claims that joey was his um supplier and he was out on these streets selling the weed for joey and that he sold some of the weed to jesse carr on the night that jesse carr was killed by officer beck 
I'm just thinking, how convenient is that? So, so of course, Sheriff Platt, you know, thinks that he's tied things up in this nice little bow and he's proved his point that Ash and uh, Preston were hunting down the wrong trail and they've gotten the Department of Justice, in Justice involved in Joey Campbell's murder when the two murders weren't connected and all this stuff. But Preston and Ash, you know, they aren't buying it. So then Ash, remember, she has to go to court back, um, I think she's from New York. So she had to leave and, you know, they have a little short scene where Preston is telling her goodbye. So Preston goes to the back home, you know, to meet with Joshua and things are getting really tense between Joshua and Carrie, you know, especially since they relieved him of his duties and he's sitting at the table drinking and Carrie reminds him that they have a rule that they wouldn't drink in front of the kids, but he's like, he don't give a damn, you know, he's depressed, he's upset and she better leave him alone. So when Preston comes in, um, Beck tells Carrie to leave the room. So of course she's upset that she can't sit in and hear what they talk about. So they basically have just like a man to man talk about race relations. And Joshua says that um, if he killed a black kid, that um, it wouldn't be an issue because nobody cares about black on black crime. And then Preston asked him about Joey and who was the police officer that actually killed him. And so Joshua says that um, he's reminded every day that he's black and he always has to fight for his manhood. But the day he was tired, um, his world came crashing down on him. So then Preston, you know, gets this concerned look on his face and he's like, you know, did you mean what you said in that video about having a license to kill crackers? And then Joshua gets upset and tells him to get out of the house. So I'm thinking that is leading to Joshua kind of like having a moment when he killed Jesse Carr because he was so frustrated and probably knew that they had killed um, Joey Campbell. But, you know, that's just me speculating that's yet to be seen. So over with Ash, you know, she's arrived home and she's at Javier's house and she learns when she walks in that they have a court appointed um, mediator there and that her visitation with Kai has to be supervised. And so, you know, she goes off the handle real quick, but then she pulls herself back. And, you know, when she realizes that the lady is going to write down everything that she says and does. And so then Kai runs into the room and, you know, of course she missed her mom and she's hugging and kissing on her and says that she has a surprise for her. So Javier and the girlfriend, they end up leaving. Then the next scene we have with them, they are at the courthouse. And so the judge on the case, uh, she has an accent, like she might be from the West Indies or something. She basically lets Ash know that she's not playing the radio with her, that she takes everything that's going on seriously. And we learned that Ash and Javier actually served in the military together and that they were overseas together and that um, Ash could possibly be suffering from um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is what's causing her outbursts. And the um, judge says that she you know, has to take everything into account and that even though Ash was going to see a psychiatrist, that what she had received from the psychiatrist didn't carry much weight. And then Ash, you know, goes into this heartfelt plea saying how she was raised, I think her mom passed away and then the dad got sick and she ended up having to be in foster care for like a year and a half and how there's a difference between being, you know, the biological parent and being somebody who's just there helping to take care of you and care for you. And so the judge basically like, you know, I feel for you. I understand what you're saying, but the merits of this case are going to supersede any personal feelings that I have. So then Ash decides to take things into her own hands because later on we get a scene where she doesn't invite Javier over and then the two of them are talking, you know, and she's asking him to please drop the case. And, you know, she's all up on him and telling him that, you know, they're both suffering from um, post-traumatic stress disorder and that they both have issues. And then Javier points out to her that um, he doesn't have any issues. He's pissed off because I guess their breakup was because Ash slept with another man. So I guess the way she deals with her stress is that she goes around screwing people because remember she slept with Maceo um, over in North Carolina the first night that she met him. And she almost slept with Preston, even 
the, the last episode or the episode before that. So anyway, the two of them end up having sex together. And afterwards, you could tell that Ash, it was just sex for Ash. And then Javier is kind of like regretting, you know, letting it happen. And then Ash asked him again to drop the custody case. But he says he's not going to do it. And why did he say that? Because old girl pulled out her cell phone and come to find out she recorded them having sex and says that she is going to use the tape to ruin his um, relationship with the girlfriend if he doesn't drop the case. But I don't know how it's going to work out because Javier says that the only thing she proved is that she was an evil woman and that she has issues. So he may be willing to um, lose his current girlfriend uh, in an effort to get back at Ash. So back in North Carolina, the governor is preparing for a press conference to address the growing tensions. And she has like all her advisors and her sidekicks in the room with her, including Arlen Cox. And so he wants to offer up um, some armored vehicles that transport prisoners doing riots and uprisings and things that he says that a friend of his own the company that makes them. And then the other guy who I can't remember his name, he was in there and then he was basically telling the governor that she needs to bring in the National Guard, but you know she's insisting that she's not going to do that, that she believes that the local police and the sheriff's department can take care of everything and that bringing in you know, all the big guns was only going to escalate the situation. So we move over to Pastor Janae and she's hosting a meeting, you know, to kind of, you know, talk to the people and keep, you know, everybody calm prayer, you know, and then they're singing some songs and Shamika Campbell is there. And of course she's sitting there, you know, freaking out like what's going on. And then we have shots, you know, of the city where you can see, you know, the police in riot gear and they're moving in. And then all of a sudden you see the artillery come in and the, the big tanks, you know, that we all see when uprisings have happened, you know, after police shootings here in the great old USA. And so it was just, chaotic and it was just so real and this is the point where I was just like oh my god please don't let anything bad happen oh and one thing I forgot to mention was when Sean was at school two white kids cornered him in the bathroom and so he was like really afraid and then in the scene where they were having the service with Pastor Janae. We seen um, Sean getting home from school and you know, the people are already starting to destroy property and carrying on in the streets. And so when he runs to his house, he can't get in. And then later we see someone come to the church to get Shamika and let her know that something's going on or they can't find Sean. Then we have a scene where the governor is watching, you know, all these um, media outlets and, you know, they're showing the growing tension and increased militarized presence of the police force. And Sarah comes in to ask her if she's ready for the press conference and, you know, where did, exactly did she want to have it. So the governor lets her know that she's decided to cancel the press conference. So it's become apparent that she has caved in to the pressure of her constituents and, you know, Arlen Cox, who probably threatened to pull his money out of her little school um, rehab program that she gave in and decided, you know, to let them bring in the National Guard and whomever else. We have a scene where Preston meets with Arlen Cox again, and Cox says um, the uprising is a reminder to him that the government is too involved in their lives. It was like, you know, none of this would be happening at the DO. Jay hadn't sent Preston and Ash there and that they should have let the local police handle it and things would have been wrapped up by now. But of course, you know, Preston is like, that's not the case and that their presence was needed there to get to the truth of both murders, not just the um, Jesse Carr murder. So the conversation goes to Sergeant Durkins and Preston insinuates that Cox killed Joey, but he didn't come out and say it and Cox is there with his lawyer. And so the lawyer comes in, you know, basically was telling Preston he was going too far, but Cox told him to stand down and back up that he could handle this. So Cox tells Preston to spend his time pursuing the rioters that are out there causing mayhem in the streets and don't worry about what he's doing. So then we have a scene where someone comes in and gets Shamika Campbell out of the church, you know, so she can go look for Sean. And then she's running through the streets trying to find him and calling out to him and asking people if they've seen Sean. And then, you know, like I say, they were setting stores on fire and, you know, just 
the typical riot thing that's going on. And then we have a scene where Sean picks up a garbage can and busts out the window of a police cruiser. And so they run over and, you know, apprehend him and Shamika tries to intervene and they knock her to the ground. So when Preston is coming out of meeting um, Cox, he heads over to the police station and he sees Shamika sitting on the stoop and he asks her, you know, what's wrong, what's going on? And she lets him know that they arrested Sean, you know, in connection with the uprising and that they are refusing to let her see him and that they won't set bail for him. So, so Preston goes in and meets with Lieutenant Breland, you know, to try and get him to let Sean go. Lieutenant Breland makes it clear that Sean was committing a crime, that he was arrested for rioting, and that he is not going to release him and let him go. And also, when uh, Preston was in talking with uh, Lieutenant Breland, he let him know that he saw him, because they had actually turned the water hoses on the people like it's day of 1960s Birmingham. Like, <laughs> I could not believe that. And then I was trying to think, like, with the recent uh, risings that's taking place around the country, were they turning water hoses on people? Because that is just, I thought that was ruled as inhumane treatment and a violation of civil rights. But Preston pointed out that he saw him stop the police officers from hosing the people down. And so he knew that there was some good in him. But like I said, Breland said he wouldn't let Sean go. So Preston might as well go on his way. And then the show ended with, you know, it was nighttime and the looters and the rioters were still out running around. And then we have a scene of Joshua Beck and he's standing on the street corner when a guy runs past him. And then you can see all these blue lights, you know, flashing blue lights, like closing in. And then Joshua has this like stunned look on his face. So I don't know if like the police were coming in on him or somebody was pointing a gun at him or what was going on. So hopefully they don't kill Joshua Beck. I mean, I wouldn't put it past them, but let's just pray to God that nothing uh, bad happens to him. And so that was it. Like I said, very, very, very powerful episode. And if you're not watching this show, you need to watch this show and you need to tell about 10 friends that they need to be watching this show because this is a phenomenal show and they better get some kind of awards uh, for this because the acting is superb, the writing is superb, and it's, it's just amazing. So guys, go ahead and let me um, know what you thought about the episode. Leave your comments below, rate the video, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And I shall talk with you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.